All right, we're live. So thanks, Ian, for for leading the Enable Education uh, monthly meeting, and uh, we're really excited to um, see where this goes this year. So awesome. without Thank further ado, Ben, for having us here, and I'm super excited to introduce uh, Noosh from the Brandeis Heller School for Social Policy Development, who is in his final semester of the MBA program there and is helping us out with a really tricky design problem around the metadata for enable prostheses and the whole general design family tree of what's possible. Uh, but I'll let uh, Noosh uh, introduce himself and talk a little more about that project and uh, maybe how others could get involved too. Hi everybody, my name is Noosh Luai. As Ian just mentioned, uh, I'm a second year MBA in my final semester at the Heller School. Uh, my MBA is focus concentration right now is focused on sus uh, sustainable development SID. Uh, I'm really excited about this opportunity to work with uh, Enable along with uh, the NIH to kind of like help create like a easy process flow, especially when it comes to the, the, the metadata part to allow users to easily navigate uh, the system and find uh, what they're trying to look for or, and, and something like that. So uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity and I, I look forward to, you know, speaking with everybody here on uh, ways that we can help improve the system and the process flow to make navigation easy, especially on the, the search bar and so forth. So at a higher level where this conversation came from, was on the Enable forums. There's the device catalog, and there's so many devices. It's a lot of information to sort through. And it's sort of like this rich open source hardware community where there's been so many contributions worldwide. And what we're trying to do is aggregate and organize some of that. And we saw a huge opportunity here uh, for a student intern to like wrap their brain around this design challenge. And we reached out to the NIH. And at the same time, the NIH is redesigning their 3D print exchange. So uh, just a random moment when both organizations have the need for this design problem. Uh, and we found a fantastic uh, student to work on this so that we can sort of aggregate all of the information that's out there on model repositories like Thingiverse, on the device catalog, linked from different NIH 3D print exchange pages kind of focusing the tip of the spear to a single entry point. And so that when we were talking to uh, Nush about what the deliverables could be for this internship, there were sort of two that rose to the top level. And the first was redesigning the metadata schema for the NIH's 3D print exchange. And the second one was sort of creating a family tree of devices. Because from the first enable device, there has been so many derivative designs, and a lot of it, it's hard to tell. Is this the full hand platform? Is this an accessory for one of the platforms that could plug into an existing design? So uh, I guess, Nish, we could start with talking a little bit about your methodology, like where you're starting from on the interview standpoint. You want to talk a little bit about your goals for, for how to research this? <laughs> I'm um, sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, just I was just pulling up the interview questions per se. But so far, I created about four questions. And I think I spoke with you uh, last week about, you know, reorganizing uh, the questions per se to allow, I guess, the folks to just make a more interesting interview per se. Uh, but as you was as you was talking about first, in terms of the design process, uh, I'm sorry, let me just pull up my questions that I had. So we thought we'd start with yeah. all of the Enable chapter leaders and the Enable experts, sort of the uh, the pros who've been doing this for a long time. Uh, Nush could get in front of them and ask them a series of like interview questions for what matters and go from there. So in terms of like the questions, and I, I think going back to like the first deliverable and so forth, in navigating there from like the beginning to the to the end, especially when it comes to the metadata, we we wanted to kind of like understand like some of the problems in terms of the design and so forth that people in, in, encounter 
what what are like the most uh search uh design question that folks i mean sorry design that folks are looking for and so forth and if we can kind of like understand and find the the, the answer to the question, we can better uh, uh, basically, in a sense, design like a process flow that will allow the most such atoms to, to be easily uh, accessible for folks and so forth. And some of this comes down to just how we individually in our brains, right? We all have metadata is data about data. So we all have in our brains the attributes and we think of en enable prosthesis. Like, how do we think about that? Is it a mechanical design or a bionic design? Uh, what sort of limb difference is it for? From a fingertip to a wrist to an elbow. And those are sort of just the starting points, but there's probably a lot more. And like, we probably care a lot about, like when we search for a design, what type of limb difference, what type of technology we could use to make it. But we also care about things like, what plastic should it be made in? Uh, are there kits available? Uh, how much of it is printed, how much of it isn't. And so Nish is going to engage with the community to sort of sort out what do we care about and what's the hierarchy? Like, what do we care the most about? And then we can work with the folks at the NIH's 3D print exchange to sort out like how that actually fits into their website, how the filters and checkboxes and interface works uh, so that it'll make it a little easier for folks to sort through the plethora of global designs that have evolved. So we thought that probably the first group that Nush could talk to would be enable leadership, but also like chapter leaders, particularly practitioners who are like matching hands with people who need hands. And I think the other part that's interesting about that is taking a step back and looking at the DIY open source prosthesis community as a subset of the broader prosthesis community. And does a medical prosthesis maker think differently about metadata and how they think about a, which device to select than an open source DIY like a makerspace person? Like maybe we have different mental paradigms on the physician side and on the maker side. And so I guess, uh, Nush, we were sort of just getting started in your interview protocol for how to get going with these and finding the right group of people to ask those questions to. Uh, but I know that we were also thinking about like sort of as that conversation evolves, building something like a family tree of designs. So yes, uh, and I think we, we talked about that in terms of, I think, I think the first was the original nine designs per se and how, how all the design and stuff like that, especially when it comes to like limbs, uh, uh, but different parts of the body, I basically evolve in a sense like that. And basically going back to the, the, the concept of like the process feel using those original design, those nine designs per se, and basically building off that. And I think you, 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 you uh, the best way that I can interpret it, and I, I'm guessing m m many of you folks can interpret it like that. You mentioned something about, like the core component of like a, a, a game, a PC game and stuff like that computer. Like you have like the original parts. Uh, uh, John, you have a question, sorry. Oh, you're on mute. I did some work on an enabled devices family tree. So when you're ready, I'll just show it to you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that is highly appreciated. Uh, but yeah, basically building from that, uh, I, I guess I I know I, I'm 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 not a huge gamer, bro. I know something about let's say like a, a going to like a car website, Toyota car website, and kind of finding like the base model and basically branching off that and kind of like going so forth. And I'm seeing you're shaking your head, so you agree with that for a second. So yes, um, yeah, we're looking at industry parallels, and so one of the sites we looked at was PC Part Picker. For if you're like designing a custom PC, you pick the motherboard and then it sorts so only CPUs and RAM and power supplies that fit that motherboard will be filtered. We're thinking like a same, same sort of like filtering on the 3D print exchange for, okay, I want to do an upper limb prosthesis that has no electronics, that works from the wrist. And then we can see like what are the top designs that sort out of that. And I like the idea of the car website too. It's sort of there's this matching problem across any type of product. And we just have to figure out what the meaningful 
steps are to like sort out the 80% to get to the 20% that you want to actually pick from. And I also think that uh, it's great that there's been a ton of work done on this family tree side. So we can really start to hang the designs off of that and contextualize some of this. And so that's a short-term delivery for this. This is gonna be ready by December. The folks from NIH are ready to code it and put in those sort, sort features. We did a, we got a demo of where their website's headed. We have a link in the chat to the older version. If you go to 3dprint.nih.gov, you can see how it stands today. But this is the last version. There's a new version that's being developed that will launch by the end of the year. So we have to get them some of this schema for the metadata in the short term. And Nush will be with us through December working on this. But after that, we're going to need a lot of help from the community to fill that in. So this first internship is creating the structure, like where to put all the pieces and how to sort them. But then per model, we're going to need community engagement to really build out like for the Phoenix hand. What are all the resources to build this? And we want to—we don't want to recreate documentation. There's so much out there. We just want to aggregate and focus it in one place. So we'll need a lot of help, like building out the raptor hand, building out the cyborg beast, and like all of the things that hang off of those. And maybe we sort them differently based on, we could talk to different practitioners about what are the useful ones. Like maybe the ones that we started with eight, 10 years ago are not the same that we're using day by day today. And I think yes. there's also a big opportunity to sort of focus the best documentation, right? There's so much out there from text guides to video guides uh, to uh, like 3D model repository sites. We can put that all in one place and start to rank it a little bit more. And we could also potentially work to realize, oh, like maybe the kits available on 3D Universe, we want to reconfigure some of which kit is the best kit or what's in those kits. It sounds like um, of, of the, the things that you guys are describing, the idea of having forking um, like in GitHub yep. um, would be a, a definitely a, a wonderful addition. You could sort of see like which devices have the same root, um, you know, in some sort of visual way of, of connecting some of some of the uh, iterations. Um, in terms of ranking them too, I'd love to, to see um, a way that the community can be a little bit more involved. Right Absolutely. now it's sort of like a guesstimate, um, but it would be great, you know, if NIH has that um, sort of capacity, if if the ranking system, just like with the, you know, the data is something where the, you know, the user is going to, you know, somebody's gonna have a design and they're gonna upload it, I would imagine then tag, you know, how their device fits into this network. Um, and it would be great if, um, you know, I don't know if, if there was required um, feedback or, you know, sort of like an automatic system that the NIH had that if somebody downloads this, um, they can, you know, basically be giving feedback and that would change the, uh, the rating system. That's but a again, great point. One thing ahead. they will have <laughs> that, that doesn't exist very well today is like almost like a Thingiverse like makes where you'll be able to post the one you made with like a picture and your settings and materials. And so there is gonna be some of that like ability to attach what the work that people have done to the model and the resources that they're using. Well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, we have as sort of a requirement for getting different badges related to devices, requirements for, um, you know, print quality, you know, showing that somebody has the, the capacity to, to print, you know, a specific device. And it, it could be great. I mean, I don't know, maybe I can pass this to John. It could be great if those two pieces could get glued together. So, you know, not only right now, it, it's all in the back end. So there's, you know, one of our admin team that gets an email with a couple of photos and they have to basically approve, yes, this badge um, looks good enough, but it could be interesting to have it be more transparent and have you know, on the some sort of a public facing community page, here's everybody sharing their prints. Um, and, you know, the getting the badge or not could be that wouldn't have to necessarily be right there in public, but you could have all that documentation be there. Um, yeah, I just want to capture. Yeah. And, you know, Nusha, I think you, you're probably going to be 
um, getting a lot of feedback from a lot of people, but I added some links in the chat. There's a couple community events that are coming up. They could be really wonderful ways for you to connect to um, some medical professionals involved with Enable. Um, that's next week. And also this Friday is uh, Kyle Reeser's presentation about his trip to Tanzania. He made a, a 3D printer um, that was boxed up um, initially that he could bring with him like a traveling 3D printer. But he, he might be a really interesting guy um, to ask about sort of the metadata for devices as well. John? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so there's a link in the chat. In fact, I'll share my screen for a moment. Uh, to here. So first of all, be aware that there is such a thing as an enable app. Um, I have some cautionary notes for you, but it does exist. And it's pretty interesting. Um, here's the branch that has to do with the Phoenix hand. And then it shows some of the others. I believe that there are settings one can make so you can sort. There's actually a lot more on this than is currently showing. Um, but the point is about four years ago, I spent a long time, here you go, here's the complete view. Wow. Right, <laughs> making quite a rich um, enable atlas of devices. And when you, the display is a little wacky, I see, but when you zoom in, there you go, you get further information and a tree about how it relates. And so suffice it to say that there's a lot here that you might want to look at. However, having spent a lot of time on, it, on this, right? So here are different ways of coding it and you can see that there are enable C, right? et cetera. You can explore it. Um, I spent a lot of time on this. I'm not sure that anyone has made use of it. So, and furthermore, it's the, 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 the ecosystem is much more complicated than it was then. And so this is a cautionary note. My point is, I think that you should design this not to be true history, but to be useful conceptually for wrapping your head around the evolution of the uh, enabled devices and helpful for helping people make decisions about which device they want to use because that's who it's really for. I made something for posterity and as a result it benefited no one. If you make something for the end users you have in mind, it may benefit the end users you have in mind who have, I presume are potential makers. And with regard to that, I think we already know some important things, which is that because of the historical inertia, everyone looks to the Phoenix hand, but it's really quite antiquated now. Um, my impression <clears throat> is that the kinetic hand would be a good thing for people to think about if they're actually gonna make something to give to a person. But it's possible that the Phoenix is as good as any if they just wanna make sure that they know how to 3D print and do other things. Rick may have some ideas about that. Um, how do we want to point people? And once we've decided how we want to point people, you, Anush, and Ian can make sure that whatever visual you come up with leads them down the garden path to the right decision. Totally. Um, the biggest problem that we've had with the kinetic, it's, an, it's first off, it's an amazing design. The problem is a lot of the printers cannot do TPU. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of TPU requirements to build a kinetic hand very well. A lot of the Bowden extruders um, don't, don't lend themselves well to feeding uh, TPU filament. So it, it's sometimes in order to create that hand, they may need assistance from somebody with a little more sophisticated printer. Whereas the Phoenix doesn't really care. There's, there's no requirement for TPU right. in that. Is there any other design that you think is a better go-to 
goal hand? I think that the reason I like the Phoenix is because it's just so simple and easy. And people who really don't have a very big workspace are able to print it. We just uh, helped one of our end users who had an extremely small workspace and we gave him a, a utility that now allows him to dovetail it. Oh, cool. Um, which really does help even if you're going to be doing, even if you're one of the ones that's gonna be thermoforming, the dovetailing still works beautifully as long as you do that first. Before, okay. before you thermal printer, it'll never fit. <laughs> but I mean, I don't personally build Phoenix hands myself anymore. I, I have to agree with John, but for somebody that's getting started, I don't know of one that's easier, that has a, any less of a requirement for a, a sophisticated printer. Some of these guys are using very, very small printers. One of the guys wrote me, he was using one of the little cubes. And, and he just had no workspace at all. Um, and there's no way he could have done TPU. No way. It, it, would, it would have cost him to fail. He'd have to order a spool and it wouldn't have worked. That's a great point. So print material, like the limitations of what you can fabricate is a huge thing to filter on. Yeah. And, and a lot of the Bowdens um, don't do well with TPU. They jam. Um, and if you don't have a, a heated bed, a lot of the times the TPU just doesn't do well either. Um, now the kinetic, I mean, if you, if you have the ability to print TPU, I don't know of a better build. That's, it's an amazingly uh, elegant, elegant hand, elegant build, allows you to do a lot of things that the other hands don't do. And it's super easy. You can do one in a couple of days, even print time. I, I love the hand, but not everyone can print it. Okay. So um, I, I think it's worth pursuing this a little bit further. One is I see that Ben has just discovered the pro mimetic hand. Um, are you familiar with that one, Rick? Uh, could you repeat the Yeah. If the you name? look at, at um, Ben's latest, where'd it go? By Christian Silva. I, yes, uh, right. Ben just linked to Christian that. Silva's pro mimetic hand, the very last link in the chat. Mm. Boy, what a wonderful design that is. I, I'm, I'm looking for it. I apologize to all of you. I was on a, another call for a okay. second there. I got called away. Here, I Christian saw Silva is, is quite a superstar. Um, the other real superstars in education that we're looking at is the high school group Sage Prosthesis. Uh, and they have sorted out sort of a template for us to build from. That's right. Where if, if you look at like just conceptually thinking from metadata schema, they do have it breaking that broken down by what type of limb difference it attaches to and by their top designs. And the thing that really inspired me watching their talk a couple months ago when they came to this group was they're one of the only groups that I've heard of where they're working with the same customers time and time again. They have that feedback loop going where they'll make a hand, see how someone uses it, and then make it better. I thought that was such a cool program. And as a result, I think they've surfaced different designs than I see that's highlighted great. elsewhere on the internet. Well, so you should, well, that's great, Ian. Um, is that um, Tanya Lurch's group? Yes. Yes. Great. And you're in touch with them, Ben, uh, Ian? We haven't uh, introduced them to us yet. Uh, so that's so, on our roadmap to do so. That's great. Uh, I mean, Tanya is, is also, uh, as, as the proof and the pudding shows, she's also a great educator. She'd be a really good person for you to involve in these, in these meetings. Uh, she can probably provide some good advice about the promimetic hand, which may not require a TPU. But my other question was, <clears throat> is... The TPU, the only challenge, this is for you, Rick, the only challenge with the mimetic hand, and if so, is it plausible that we could find some TPU people, maybe including Rick Williams, who could do the, the appropriately scaled uh, TPU joints to then send to people? We have got some builders that have been awesome about that. We even have one that can print we have one young lady who contacted me that he can, he can do carbon fiber. 
I mean, um, so the answer is absolutely yes. There's people that can in fact do it. Um, it, it it's just disheartening to order a, a big spool of expensive TPU only to find out you can't use it. Well, that's why uh, yeah. finding a few TPUers and yeah. if they if they could reliably be on tap, it might provide a way of offering the best oh, hand yeah. to, to more people. That's Let a great just, idea. And that could be done through yeah. a community effort or through like 3D universe kits uh, where they could be aggregated. And I like the idea of like, it's not just TPU, it's carbon fiber. It's how many makerspaces have marked forge printers that are not being run every day that we could yeah. get from like really quality prints from. People are awesome about helping with that too. We just did one recently and, and a pet one. And, and I had a few people because I can't do carbon fiber and, and she jumped right in. Oh, I'll be happy to. I mean, I've, it was great. Hmm. So, I mean, uh, putting it out there to, to the builders, you'll, you'll probably get more than you want. It, it's, it's incredible. Ben, do you have a, a comment? Yeah, I got a quick question for Noosh. Um, have you made an account yet on the hub? Sorry, no, I've, I haven't made an account on the hub yet. Um, but I will do that. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say if uh, if it's possible to introduce your project, even if it's just sort of preliminary, you know, I'm a Brandeis student, I'm gonna be working, you know, fall semester, I'm working with Ian. Um, I think it, it could be a really great way to um, start tracking down some some other folks because um, we can add you to different groups like the chapter leaders group, um, you know, send a message to Tanya Lurch, uh, emails, um, for some folks are going to be much more direct, but there's going to be opportunities for sort of asynchronous um, community uh, feedback, I think that way. So, okay. Um, and it could be something too, where at the same time that you're targeting specific groups, you could put sort of like a public call and say, here's my interview questions. What do you think? And just see, you know, you might get um, folks from Poland and folks from Asia and, you know, sort of folks that we wouldn't think of um, that, that have uh, something to share. The other, uh, I'd like to also, I see Alex joined. I'd like to introduce another Brandeis student, Alex, uh, who's interested in reinvigorating our prosthesis club, which has ebbed and flowed over time. Uh, but there might be more opportunity to uh, really the structure that Nish is gonna define. We're gonna have to, for each model in December, we'll have the rough idea, but we'll have to build out for each of these devices, all of the resources on the internet. And that could be a global contribution, but also any of these local chapters, like the Brandeis chapter, we can make impact by making hands for people. But we can also make impact through better information design for the whole community to use. So Alex, just wanted to thank you for joining and give you an opportunity to say hi to everyone. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm a sophomore this year, so. And I think this just goes to show that like, there's a whole bunch of different ways to contribute here. I love the conversation about material specialization. I mean, maybe like individual chapters could collaborate to make the components and share them. They're not like matchmaking is a problem. Device selection is a problem. Manufacturing is its own separate problem. <laughs> so there's lots of different entry points to contribute here. It, it's true, Ian, and uh... From, the, from your particular point of view, I think it's got more promise than it might have had in the past. Um, one of the challenges is that you need sort of reliable partners for that kind of coupling <clears throat> and they come and go. But if, as you seem to be doing, you're now identifying stable and well-established educational partners, then you know this very process of coordinating and of specializing is itself a really good learning opportunity. And there may well be some educators who um, are thinking about, for example, uh, career or project management training, no less than they are about uh, empathy and prosthetic training. So it, uh, again, I'll caution you about uh, the gap between what one can envision and what one can actually make work. But I'm really glad that you're working on putting these pieces together. I'm gonna share in the in the chat. Um, Eric Bubar, you, you mentioned, you know, 
how can students get involved and, and make a significant difference without necessarily having the, the long-term network of having you know, device users. Um, Eric Bubar has been uh, sharing some posts about printing rigs, testing rigs for devices. Um, and, and I think you, you mentioned that before, the idea that students could be providing sort of user data. Mm. Um, and that's, he's got um, a number of forums that he's created to collect community feedback. So for Alex, uh, I also shared a link to the hub. I, I think it'd be great if, if you could uh, make a, an account there, I'd be happy to, to connect you to some other uh, student chapters. And I think, um, you know, shifting away from each chapter feeling like they need to, um, you know, deliver a device somewhere, anywhere. Um, as that network grows and, and, you know, people learn about the activities of your chapter, you might find some local need, um, but you can just hit the, the ground running and be testing devices, um, the kinetic hand, um, you know, some of these other newer designs like Christian Silva's design, um, you know, we don't have any ratings for that as far as I know. So, um, you know, that there's, there's a lot of uh, things to fill in, I think for. Totally. Um, or even like guides on like how to print TPU guides. I know there's a ton of them on the internet, but could we pick the best, most accessible ones and include those in some of the resource pages? Yeah. And the other thing that I'm super excited to do is uh, sort of share the information between both sides. Have some of these students like Nish who are working on the information design and the project management aspects of this, have them build a hand, you know, get started by, and, and maybe these are just the familiarizing yourself with one of the platforms and seeing some of those challenges, which I think will help us design better information systems. And at the same time, the people who are great at building hands and developing some of these new prototypes and derivative models, like the real catters and 3D design folks, uh, they could also look at some of this, like, what is the experience for a newcomer? You know, so like sharing the problems between different expertise could be really powerful. This this is really thinking out, outside of um, sort of this current trajectory, but in the past, uh, one of our uh, lead developers in the community, Masvi, has talked about this idea of um, <clears throat> basically being able to have a way of, of tagging devices, you know, like a QR code that somebody would print out. And that could be something that could be given to a, a user with their new device, um, but also a way of tracking, you know, different devices, you know, being sent out in different places and used and different iterations. I wonder if something like that could be a really useful way too of you know, if, if a student group is, is coming up with, you know, some testing or if there's a new iteration that comes out, um, instead of feeling like they need to deliver that device themselves, if they could track where it's being printed and, and used in different places, um, and it, if the 3D Print Exchange had the capacity for that, you know, within the... Within the makes. Um, within the makes, um, that could be really cool. So. I this is a could. long way of saying if you could rope in, and, and this is something that, that has come up recently with Adam uh, Jennings, who's he's sort of oriented around kind of the healthcare perspective on uh, on these devices. Masvi and Adam could be um, helpful in uh, thinking about, yeah, how you guys move forward. And, and it might be just enough momentum. I do feel like with Masvi, if, if there's enough other people that are interested, sometimes you can get a fire under him. And, and within you know a short amount of time, he gets going. Other times it's, it's hard to catch him, so. That's really interesting. I believe that the makes will have unique IDs within the NIH's system. And Great. then we could do also, we could link to those. We could uh, like somehow make, like you said, like a QR embed it somewhere in the device so we could look it up like someone could bring a device from one chapter and be like, I don't know who made this or what they used, but here's a serial number. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that could get really interesting too. You know, again, if uh, if Rick came out with an iteration and then six months later, you know, all of a sudden his devices were, were being populated in a couple of different chapters that were using it, he could specifically follow up with those groups and offer his support um, instead of just, you know, posting in one place and waiting for, um, you know, a video to pop up in his Facebook feed or something that looks familiar. 
I'm wondering if if we could start by doing that when we authorize the badge. Mm -hmm. We're really supposed to do that when we authorize the badge, and a lot of people they'll put very rudimentary information on their badge requests as to speeds and feeds, what type of printer and, and what type of materials. We could probably raise the enforcement a little bit on that, even to have that record to help get started. And then kick, we could kick a QR out of that just as easily. I mean, it's just as. Yeah, that'd be motivating too. If, if you're a maker and people are printing out your hands and testing them out, um, or if you're a sort of a designer, you could follow up with them too. You could sort of have uh, that capacity within the network to be um, connecting those dots. Totally. I, I like this because this sort of all comes down to like record of truth, like the serial number, like how do we reference the device? And right now the badging, I think is it's a great methodology where you check and they post pictures, but it's a little opaque, right? It's a little behind the scene and not exposed to, to newcomers. And we could leverage some of this like Thingiverse style makes on the NIH's site to make that information more public and vetted. And then to give designers like Rick more vision into who else is making my designs, which could be really motivational on both sides, like sorting to find a design and contributing designs, like seeing the impact your contribution makes. I mean, the badging is in place. It might be a really great place just to get started just to get some trajectory and see what we run into. Um, we, could, we could probably improve that process on my end and, and I could just be more uh, enforcing some very standard, you know, printer model. What did you use? What are your speeds and fees? What temperatures, what materials? You know, we probably could just put together a list, include that in the badging and it would probably go a long way in getting this started. Mm, and like you're idea. saying, now you're giving them motivation because in order to get the badge, you know, they either fill it out or they don't. You know, it's a, I hate denying, but I, I, I can see where you're trying to go and it makes a lot of sense to and use I like the this badge. Too because we're not saying you did a bad job. We're saying you need yeah, more documentation, yeah. right? A good job is not a good job if others can't learn from it. I mean, it's something we can do now, you know. Um, and I, I don't have a problem doing that. I, uh, you know, uh, people always get mad at me if I turn down a badge, but it, it, it's usually because they didn't follow the instructions. So that sounds that sounds great. I do want to uh, give you another bold phobie uh, conservative note. One of the challenges with uh, Thingiverse is that when people people don't just declare that they've made one they'll put up their revised design. And their revised, their revised design includes all of their customizations and many of their mistakes, and it just complicates the field. So I think you should be careful not to reproduce that problem. We've been thinking about this a lot. In the conversation that Nish and I had with the, uh, the NIH 3D Print Exchange folks, they mentioned the same thing on the PPE side. So they have uh, mm -hmm. During COVID, the pandemic response printable PPE section, they had the same thing where anyone could contribute, but then they have to have a way to uh, do peer review or clinical review. And right. I think that could be built yeah. into this where like clinical review equivalent could be like enable community, enable leadership says these are good models. And then there could be just like derivative models that a contributor puts and they haven't been vetted yet. But I know that NIH has a robust vetting system for other medical devices that we could leverage on the back end and maybe expose that differently on the public facing side. Yeah, the whole remix thing gets crazy on, on Thingy. And it's only been recently in the last couple of months that uh, Thingy changed. And now you don't have to download each file individually. They weren't forcing you to do that for a few months there and it was it was terrible. You know, if you had a big design, it took you forever to get all the files you needed. It just wasn't working. And they went back to the, now you can download a zip. So I'm glad they did that. But I think, you know, att attaching it to the badge is something we can control very easily. Nice. I think we should talk. I think we will need a little more time uh, for Nish to conduct these first round interviews and sort of get that metadata conversation going. 
once we have it, we should present it to you and see what else we could integrate with the badging process from that whole metadata perspective. Like in badging, which you mentioned like printer model, feeds and speeds, materials, settings. Yes, yeah. Like, and then uh, how in depth do we want, how granular do we want to get with that? And the other nice thing is, is it also gives us contacts to the real experts that know what they're doing and have done it. I mean, that is great. I, when you spend four or five days doing a print and you get to the very end and you find out you can't finish the device, it's, it's a little disheartening. Indeed. And I, I wonder too, like, could we go all the way to like, if you're running Simplify 3D, you kind of have your factory file that has both your model and your entire batch of settings. In Cura, could we share machine profiles that are really dialed in for that model, that material, that device? Because some of this could be public setting files, like settings like where you visually type them in, but some of this could be just like, you grab that file and it configures everything for you and it's sort of more turnkey. We actually use a product called Simplify 3D. I love Simplify. Yeah, that does that, all of that. The and it's a very files, nice, yeah. yeah, it does it all for you. Uh, and I love that because it saved me far more than I paid for the package. And it does exactly what you're saying. And a lot of the times we have to also, especially with the, please, I'm sorry, I always mispronounce this, the Kiwana hand, which is one of my favorites. Wow. I mean, we print a lot of those. And um, without Simplify, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even uh, know what to do. It, it just really helps with exactly what you're saying, just getting it right. And because, um, you know, you're, you're SCADing against uh, an STL, which is not very elegant. So if you have to reverse engineer the STL and put it back into an OBJ or something like that, it's, it, it's clumsy. But, oh, but it, I, it, I think this is a, a one of our problems uh, with our chapter uh, at Brandeis was the customization stage is so tricky, mm -hmm. right? Like making the generic hands and learning the platform, getting the badge is sort of one barrier. And then the next one comes with like, all right, how do I customize this using like OpenSCAD or other parametric modeling software? That's sort of like the next tier of difficulty. I, I love SCAD. I, I, I would never disparage SCAD. I love the product. But a lot of the times it's very difficult for a newcomer um, to come in and make that happen. And uh, depending upon, uh, the one thing that's nice about SCAD is you can save the profile. So you can actually save your SCAD profile under any name that you choose without hurting you know, the original design. So uh, on hands that do use SCAD, including that wouldn't even be a bad thing. So you could go back and look at the SCAD profile that was used and um, it, would, it would really help with some of the parametric designs because a lot of the times you're looking at the SCAD and there's like, a, a, you know, there's like 40, variables yes so and many measurements yeah and, and to have one that worked is, is a great starting point and i wonder too like the future and i'm starting to see some of this is as 3d scanning becomes more accessible right. at a certain point the community might move from taking a set of measurements to taking a set of scans but that whole design step of customization is a really high barrier technically not so much. We, we've been having very good luck. Um, we're, we've switched over all our big scanners to LiDAR. And we're finding that it's astonishing how well it does. So um, the LiDAR has bought us an enormous, uh, not only much cheaper, easier to try, because we got one scanner, it takes two people to lift it. Uh, we, this, this thing's on our phone. Yep. And we've gone out and done these remarkable scans that were more than good enough on uh, nubs or stumps, whatever is the proper word now, and um, try to get a, a, a five-year-old kid to sit still on a big scanner. The, the, the LiDAR has been amazing, especially for, we're doing animals too, which is very difficult to get them to yes. sit still. So the LiDAR has been awesome for us. And so we've switched out all our phones. Now all of them have LiDAR and it's, it's bought us a lot um, all the way around.
so this is the thing I'd love to talk to you about, learn more about too. We do a lot of scanning here, but we haven't integrated that with any of our uh, enable chapter that we've always done from a parametric set of measurements. And some we of that be is accessibility to. to the client, yeah. like who we can get to. We'd be happy to actually go cradle to grave with you and just do one. Um, yeah. All you have to do is do that. Yeah, find somebody at your site that has a, I don't know, a, a relatively two-year-old iPhone or, or an iPad, and you, you just wouldn't even believe how, how, what a good job it does. I would, I'll follow up. We'll talk. In the next couple of months, I want to pick you up on that and learn more about what we can do as we build this like a new web exchange. Maybe one of the things we fork on is customizability. Is it variable-based? based on measurements or is it scan based based on model subtraction or 3d workflow well what's nice is if you're using scad you get the best of both worlds yeah yeah you have both however unfortunately a lot like jacqueline i, I don't want to say his name wrong i always do that uh he's moving away from scad and, and i'm sad about that he doesn't want to use it anymore um I think personally that's a mistake because because it gives us so much. Um, the parametric capabilities of SCAD are, are are amazing, and you can't beat the price; it's free. Yeah. So you're taking a piece of hardware you've already bought, like just a phone. The software for lidar is free for the most part. You have SCAD, and now you've done this. You you've basically included everybody that just can't afford uh, hardware. Or software, you know, in order to do their bills. I, I think that the SCAD model is awesome. So, uh, Nish, hopefully this is giving you an idea of how we're thinking about some of these sorting design challenges. And Alex, too, to hear some of the different ways that the Prosthesis Club could engage. It's, it's so many problems. We haven't even talked about the other big problem that we've been looking at like globally is matchmaking like how do we actually take schools and match them with humans that have limb differences another huge challenge i was really hoping i was talking to mastiff at one point and i really wanted to put up a i really wanted to put up a enable facing website that like we don't need a, yet another website i get that but I think what would be nice is if I had an uh, access to an enable facing server where maybe we could do all this in the background without affecting production and, and other what other people are doing and build like a peepso, mm -hmm. um, which that's kind of what it does. It, it, what? And it's called a peepso. It, it's, it's like a hub. Peepso is a product, but this is kind of what it does. It, it it takes people and it takes projects and it puts them together and it does it quite elegantly and it's cheap. Uh, and all you need is a standard server to get it going. And then once you get it going, you just don't open it up to anyone but the developers until you're good and ready. And there's other options that are very similar. Um, but some of the things the hub is very restrictive on. Um, even even file transfers and things of that nature can be very restrictive and difficult to get even people to let it, them know where it is. I mean, I'm not knocking it. It's just sometimes difficult, you know, to do there. Totally. Um, ben, do you have a, a final comment? I know we're coming into our last couple of minutes. Yeah, I was just going to ask Alex and Noosh if, if they had any questions. I know I'm looking at the time, too, and I was thinking it'd be great to, to see what you guys are are wondering at this point. I'm sure you're flooded with uh, <laughs> lots of links and new ideas. But uh, I mean, I'm, in terms of like the questions per se, when I'm going through, especially with the the information that you provided, uh, Ben, and the information that John provided uh, in terms of the trees, I know I'll, I'll probably reach out to Ian for the questions uh, to see if I can better uh, understand, uh, uh, I guess, just how everything kind of like build and so forth. Uh, but right now, I don't have any specific question because I need to fully go through all the information and in link that was given to me, per se. I did have a question, per se, and I know it's kind of like a city question, but I wanted to 
I guess reach out to Ian to 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 answer that question per se. It might be a little a simple answer per se, but um, I'll I, I'll reach out to Ian to answer that question uh, after uh, the uh, the the meeting. Great. I can't wait to see where you take this project. And I'm so glad to have you here to expose it a little bit more to the broader Enable community. Thank you. Alex, is there any questions sitting on your mind? Um, not, like nothing in specific. Um, I think I just need to connect with you about next steps for Process and Club and what that looks like this year. Totally. So sort of our goal here this semester, what we're doing in summary, creating a big structure about how to sort designs. And then next semester and after is filling that structure with the best resources for each design. And then new challenges as they come along. But that's the big picture of, of where Brandeis is headed and what we're thinking about contributing to the, the education side and the Enable community broadly. I think we're just about at time. Thank you everyone for engaging in a productive conversation today. And I think we'll have lots of follow-up questions and so many resources to unpack after this. Great. It's awesome. And uh, in the hub, um, underneath the, the event posting, there's the video recording of this meeting and I'll copy the chat right now. Um, and share that as well. So um, feel free, uh, Nush and Alex, to, to use that uh, those comments underneath the, the post also, if you wanna get a hold of um, everybody and looking forward to, to following up and seeing where you guys take this too. It's, I think it's really exciting to be able to collaborate with you guys. Thank you, Ben, for organizing us as always. Uh, John, for the, all of the years of contribution that we're going to help aggregate. I, I can't believe you already have a lot of this and uh, we can sort through some of it. And Rick, we'll be reaching out in the future uh, for thinking about some of this customization question. Oh, I, I'd be happy to do it. It's, it's uh, you know, we've, we've, been, uh, we, we've been struggling much like you with, with this, um, like even with, I, I know John and, and Ben have been helping me out a lot. Like we, we, we've been doing uh vacuum forming you yeah. know a, a, a lot now we've we've really we built our own system uh, it's a homemade vacuum form we've got a lot of mileage out of it and you know we can share with you what we did and how we did it absolutely um it, it can be a much less expensive process you know well it, it's good to be in good hands i thank you all too Well, we're just about at time, so we can probably uh, stop the stream and we'll end the meeting, but we'll continue to be on email and we'll be back in another month for another education meeting and uh, try to find some